chapter 10. Chapter 10 is all about the cost of capital. You can see the topics that are on the, on the uh, screen right there. Quite a few for this chapter, actually. Okay, so let's talk about capital. When, when we talk about the cost of capital, we're talking about how do corporations um, receive the funding they need for expansion, um, product, new product lines, um, just anything that they want to do as they need new sources of funds of capital, where do they come from? And you can see there's lots of options here. Uh, the big three are debt, preferred stock, and common stock. And you can see that common stock and debt are broken up into a couple of different categories. Um, we always have to have some formulas in this chapter, or in pretty much any chapter in, in finance. And they're usually not that bad. And it's just really important to understand each of the subcomponents of these formulas. And so we'll use the term WAC, which is Weighted Average Cost of Capital. And when you see the W in this formula, that's the weight. So the weight of debt, weight of preferred stock, weight of common stock. And we're multiplying those weights by the cost of debt. Uh, so the R sub D is our cost of debt. Multiply by 1 minus the tax rate because we get the tax benefit for having debt. Uh, basically here then we got the weight times the required cost of preferred stocks and then R sub P and then R sub S which is common stock um, or just S for stock. So basically the R's refer to the cost of each capital component then a sub D for debt, sub P for preferreds, sub S for stock. Um, it says should our analysis focus on before tax or after tax capital cost? The answer is we should focus on after tax cash flows. Uh, we should focus on after tax capital cost, uh, basically the use of after tax cost of capital in the WAC. Only the R sub D, um, the debt, needs adjustment because interest is tax deductible. That's why when we go back to the formula, only debt was multiplied by 1 minus the tax rate. Should our analysis focus on historical embedded cost or new marginal cost? Um, the cost of capital is used primarily to make decisions that involve raising new capital. So we focus on today's marginal cost for the WAC. Basically, what, what will be the cost of going out and uh, attaining more debt, <clears throat> issuing more stock if it's common or preferred? So how are the weights determined? Uh, the weights can be determined, it says, using accounting numbers or market value, book, book versus market weights. Uh, use actual numbers or ta target capital structure. So we have some choices here. Remember that when we're using accounting numbers, we're using book, okay, the historical numbers. We can look at the previous, most recently issued balance sheet, which is a historical document. Here's how we were on that date and time. And here's what, how much debt we had, preferred stock we had, and common stock we had. Um, some companies can convert that into a market value. And you can have a target capital structure that's different than your actual capital structure. You can make some adjustments to that as you choose to pay down some debt or um, issue new stocks. Um, all companies have a target structure that may be a little bit different than what their actual structure is. Um, so the example they're giving us in the PowerPoint is a company called Coleman Technologies. Um, it says that the firm calculating cost of capital for major expansion programs. Um, there's a tax rate of 40%. Um, they, they have a 15-year 12% coupon semi-annual payment non-cancelable bond that sells for 115372, so it sells at a premium. New bonds will be privately placed, placed with no flotation cost. And flotation cost is the cost of issuing a security. It's brokerage fees, underwriting fees, things like that. We're just assuming that there is no flotation cost to make it simpler. A 10% $100 par value quarterly dividend perpetual preferred stock that sells for 111.10. And then common stock that sells for 50. Um, the dividend today, D sub zero, is 419 with a growth rate of 5%. The beta of the company is 1.2. The risk-free rate is 7%. 
and the market risk premium is 6%. Bond yield risk premium is 4%. Target capital structure is 30% debt, 10% preferred, and 60% common equity. So we'll look at their capital structure. Um, it says book value, market value, and the target. So based on book value, it's 48,250. Market value is 25,570. And the target, what they'd like to try to achieve is 301060. So you can see that they're all a little bit different. Um, the number of shares of stock are not given the problem, so actual calculations cannot be done. Analysis is meant for illustration. Typically, book value capital structure will pretty much usually show a higher percent of debt because a typical firm's market-to-book ratio is greater than 1. Remember that the market-to-book ratio, we've looked at that in previous chapters, and you want that to be above 1. It's ideal that it's way above 1. So that's, that's going to cause some of the differences between these two, the market-to-book ratio. Um, so in looking at the formula again, on uh, the components of cost of debt, let's do, we'll take a look at each of these components separately. So here's the formula again, the WAC formula. R sub D, the cost of debt, is the marginal cost of debt capital. Basically, what will it cost us to issue new debt? The yield to maturity on outstanding long-term debt is often used as a measurement of R sub D. And of course, Y tax adjust, Y basically the R sub D uh, multiplied by 1 minus the T, and of course we know the answer for that is that uh, corporations are allowed to deduct interest expense on debt. They're allowed to deduct that. So it says here a 15-year 12% semi-annual coupon bond sells for 115372. What is the cost of that debt? Um, so this is semi-annual, so if you remember back to the bond chapter, which was earlier in the class, um, we have to multiply the N by 2 and divide the interest by 2. So you can see down here our inputs are 30 for the number of periods, 15 times 2. Um, you can see also then that my present value is just the, simply the cost today, the 115372. My payment is um, 60, and we have to multiply 60 because um, it is a 12% um, semi-annual bond, and so 12% of 1,000 is 120. Half of that is 60. Okay, so that's where we get the 60, and then the future value is 1,000. The, the face value of the, of the par value of the bond is 1,000. So remember, um, we have to take the payment, 12% um, times 1,000 is 120, divide that by 2. The future value is just what the, the face value of the bond is 1,000. And that gives us an answer of 5% per year for the output. But remember that we did this based on semi-annual, and so we have to double that. Okay, So basically what we're saying is that the uh, market rate of interest is essentially 10%. Okay, So this this bond is earning 10%. So after tax then, of course, we have to take this 10% um, times 1 minus the tax rate and we get 6%. And it said no flotation cost in this setup to this problem, so we ignore those. If they were, if, if we were given a flotation cost, we'd have to factor that into the cost of debt because there's a cost of uh, paying that flotation cost. Okay, so that was, and just, let me just go back and I just want to emphasize again that when you did this calculation, you'll do this in Applia, and you do that semi-annual solving for interest rates. So um, one of the Excel formulas I gave you on the spreadsheet that dealt with both bonds and present value and future value, um, that spreadsheet had um, an interest uh, finding the interest rate formula in there. And that's exactly what this was. This was just using a financial calculator, but you could, you, you really should just use the Excel files that I've given you because they're all set up. All I have to do is put in the new inputs and you'll get your output at 5%. But remember, that's based on semi-annual interest. So to compute annual interest, you just simply double that. And the formula for the WAC is based on annual interest. Okay, so this is based on annual interest. 
Okay, now let's take a look at the preferred stock. So R sub P, the marginal cost of preferred stock, the return investors require on a firm's preferred stock. So remember when we talk about using marginal rates for these, we're talking really about what is the cost today of issuing new debt or issuing new preferreds or issuing new commons. Preferred dividends are not tax deductible, so there's no tax adjustment. Just use the nominal R sub P. Um, and again, we're ignoring flotation costs. And this is a really easy calculation. And they told us in the setup to the problem that they were um, paying a $10 dividend for every share of preferred stock. And so we just simply take the dividend divided by the price and get the rate of return 9%. So the dividend was 10, the price was 111.10, and therefore the interest rate is 9. Um, is preferred stock more or less risky to investors than debt? It's actually more risky, and the only reason it's more risky is that you're not required to pay a preferred dividend. Okay, uh, If you have debt, you are required to pay that interest. It's contractually obligated to pay that interest, and if you default on the interest, um, your debt holders could potentially force you into bankruptcy. Um, if you have preferred shareholders and you stop paying them dividends, there's really nothing they can do about it. They just have to sit back and wait. Now, companies try to pay a preferred dividend because if you don't pay preferred dividends, you can't pay common dividends. So you're going to try to do everything you can to pay the preferreds. But if you have a cash shortage, you could get by without having to pay them. Um, and if you stop paying dividends on your preferreds, good luck selling more preferred stock or selling more common stock. It's not going to go well. You're not going to get the price you want because you, you're not paying dividends. Um, one final thing is, after enough time, if preferred shareholders stop getting their dividends, it is possible for them to get to gain control of the firm. At some point, it is possible. It requires some lawsuits, but it is possible. Uh, what's the yield on preferred stock lower than debt? Why is the yield on preferred stock lower than debt? Um, preferred stock will often have a lower before tax yield than the before tax yield on debt. Uh, corporations own most preferred stock. 70% of preferred dividends are excluded from corporate taxation. And I worked for a couple different very large insurance companies in my career and they owned a lot of preferred stocks. And the reason they own the preferred stocks is uh, corporations um, can deduct up to 70% of dividends received. In fact, it's even up to 80% now depending on the size of the company that owns them. And the reason for that, and I think I've mentioned that in a previous chapter, is to avoid triple taxation. Remember that um, way back early in the class, we talked about um, corporations, some advantages and disadvantages of having the corporate form. One of the disadvantages is double taxation. Remember that corporations are treated as separately taxable entities uh, by the IRS. So they pay uh, tax on their earnings. And then once they pay a dividend, they pay those dividends out with after-tax earnings. And then whoever receives a dividend has to pay tax on the dividend. So if a corporation owns a dividend, owns a stock that pays a dividend, so if my corporation that I work for owns stocks of other companies, other corporations that pay dividends, um, without any kind of exclusion, they'd be subject to triple taxation because my corporation receives the dividends, those become a part of my taxable income, and I pay tax on that, and then I um, pay a dividend, um, and then my shareholders receive uh, tax on that dividend, pay tax on the dividends received. So without that exclusion, I'd have triple taxation. So corporations like to own preferred stocks because they're very consistent, they're very steady in receiving them, and you get the 70% exclusion. So the after-tax yield to an investor and the after-tax cost to the issuer are higher on preferred stocks than debt, consistent with the higher risk of preferred stocks. So basically, you're not getting, there's just a little bit more risk with the preferred than there is with debt. And so the yield is higher, which matches the uh, risk and return um, that you want to get to. Um, the next one is um, R sub S, the cost of stock the marginal cost of common equity using retained earnings. The rate of return investors will require in the firm's common equity using new equity is R sub E. 
Uh, why is there a cost to retain earnings? Um, it's basically kind of like an opportunity cost. Earnings can be reinvested or paid out as dividends. Investors could buy other securities um, and earn a return. If earnings are retained, there's an opportunity cost, the return that stockholders would earn on alternative investments of equal risk. Um, investors could buy similar stocks earning R sub S, the, re the cost of S. Um, firms could repurchase his own stock and earn the, at the R sub S rate. So it's the opportunity cost that we have to kind of recognize by saying that there is a cost of having retained earnings, of using your own retained earnings, is what else could be used with those funds. Um, there's lots of ways to determine what the cost of equity is. There's three main ways. And in the setup to this example that they've given us here for this company is they gave us the data to do all three. CAPM is the first one, capital asset pricing model. Um, the middle one's DCF, discounted cash flow, or dividend, um, the dividend cash flows. And the bottom one is bond yield risk premium. So we'll go through and do some examples of each. And again, some more formulas for you. Um, they look kind of daunting when you first see them, but I promise once you understand each little subcomponent of what these are trying to do, they're really not that bad. So CAPM is the first one, and the CAPM is a, a model used in finance. Um, it's been used in finance for a very long time. And it's a way to try to put a value on a company or determine what the return is on a company um, if you own it, that company's stock. And what you're trying to figure out is um, how do you adjust risk with return? And that's what beta does. We've talked about beta. Uh, just a recap of what beta is. And the beta for this company is 1.2. Beta is a measurement of risk. Uh, it's a numerical formula. It's really easy to get the beta for a company, by the way. You can go to um, any finance website like Yahoo Finance or Google Finance or just anywhere where you can look up a stock, and they'll have a beta listed. Um, and they just gave it to us for this company. But they're saying the risk-free rate is 7%. So I can go out and get an investment that pays me 7% with absolutely no risk. And they're saying here the market risk premium, though, basically to get more return, I have to... Um, you know, I want to get 6% for taking on more risk. But I need to adjust that 6% by beta. Um, so a beta of 1.2 is a riskier than the market. So my R sub S, my cost of um, stock, is the risk-free rate plus the difference between the risk premium, the market risk premium, and the risk-free rate multiplied by beta. Okay, so I break that down then to 7 plus 6 times 1.2 and I get 14.2 so we're adjusting that risk premium by the beta of our individual stock and saying that our cost of stock is 14.2 uh, discounted um, I keep saying discounted cash flow dividend cash flow um, what we can do here is basically say we know that dividends today were 419 the price of the stock today was 50 and the growth rate was 5% so I have to compute my D1. D1 is just my dividend today multiplied by 1 plus the growth rate. So my dividend a year from now will be 439.95, which is, you can round that to 440. And so the cost of having stock is my dividend a year from now, 440, divided by the price today plus the growth rate, I get 13.8%. Um, can we use this methodology if growth is not constant? We can, um, but at some point we have to assume that there is a constant growth rate and it's more complicated to calculate. If we just know that um, a dividend has a very steady growth rate, this is a very easy model to use. If the growth rate is non-steady or non-constant, um, it's, it's much more difficult to do. It can be done, it's just more difficult to do. The last one is basically saying, what's the bond yield plus risk premium approach? Um, risk premium is not the same as the cap M risk premium. Uh, this method produces a ballpark estimate of the cost of stock and can be served as a useful check. So here, they just gave us all these numbers. We're just plugging the numbers given to us. 10 plus 4, of course, is 14.
So sometimes the best way to do this is just to do a average of the three if you can do all three. Now for some companies you can't use all these models. If you don't pay dividends you can't use the 13.8, um, the DCF. You could use the discounted cash flow and just com compute the company's cash flows but you can't use a dividend model. Um, but CAPM, as long as you have a beta and you've got the percentages, you can use the CAPM model. Um, so all, an average of all three, and they give us numbers on purpose that so will average out to 14. Um, so sometimes just that midpoint of 14 would make a lot of sense to use. Why is the cost of retained earnings cheaper than the cost of issuing new common stock? Well, uh, when a company issues new common stock, they have to pay for the cost of that. Uh, there's flotation costs and quite often depending on the size of the issue and the size of the company and the risk behind the company issuing the stock that could be up to 10 percent or more um, also it says that issuing new common stock sends a negative signal to the capital markets markets which may depress stock price so you know at some point the stock market is about supply and demand um, not entirely about supply and demand but there's always a fixed supply of stock for any company. It could be you know, tens of millions of shares, but there's always a fixed supply. And so whenever there's a fixed supply, you know, that, that comes into play in determining what the price is. So all of a sudden you issue more stock, there's more supply, um, and demand hasn't changed, it stands to reason that price would come down. Just basically bit basic economics there. So that potentially will depress the stock price. Now, if it's a real hot company that everybody has high expectations for, that might not be the case. So now we'll bring, just talk a little bit about that flotation adjustment, basically the cost of issuing um, securities, the cost of you know, raising capital. Um, includes the cost of part of the project's upfront cost, uh, reduces the project's estimated return, and adjusts the cost of capital to include flotation in the DCF model. Um, what we can do is include flotation in the DCF model. Okay. Um, so it says here if new common stock incurs a flotation cost of 15%, what is the R sub E? Basically the cost of issuing new equity, new stock. And you can see really all they did was take one thing and add it to the formula here. And the R sub E becomes dividends today multiplied by 1 plus the growth rate divided by the price of the stock today multiplied by 1 minus flotation, so 1 minus 0.15 plus the growth rate. That just simplifies down to 15.4. So basically what we're seeing is we're reducing the price of the stock by 15%. So for every $50 worth of stock we sell, we actually only keep $42.50 and commissions and underwriting go to the, you know, the investment banks they get 750 for each issue of stock, for each share of stock sold. So flotation cost depends on the firm's risk and the type of capital raised. I kind of mentioned that. Uh, and you know, the bigger the firm, generally the lower the risk. Uh, flotation costs are highest for common equity. Um, however, since most firms issue e equity frequently, the per project cost is fairly small. We'll frequently ignore flotation costs when calculating the WAC. Um, just to keep it simple. You know, if you were in a, in a more advanced finance class, then definitely it would probably come up more often. So what is the whack of the company then ignoring flotation costs? So we've now gone through, and for this company, we've computed the cost of each type of equity, and we went with the 10, 9, and 14, and we're multiplying that by what we want the target capital structure to be. Uh, basically what the capital structure may be after we do some new issues. And that was 30, 10, and 6. So the 0.3, the 0.1, and the 0.6 add up to be 100. And so that's the weight. We give each component of equity a weighting, 30%, 10%, 6%, multiplied by, you know, over here, the cost of debt is 10% um, times the 0.6, which is 1 minus T. Cost of preferreds is 9%. Cost of stock is 14%. And that S is really just our retained earnings. Uh, the E was if it was a new new share, new issue. That gets down to 11.1. What factors influence a company's composite WAC? Um, marketing conditions such as in interest rates and tax rates are things that a firm cannot control, but they definitely impla impact the WAC. Um, you know, the stock market being up or down, 
um, interest rates being up or down, uh, what tax rates are at, um, all come into play. Um, you know, if the stock if the stock market's depressed, um, issuing um, new shares of stock may not be a good idea. Um, you know, if you're in a bear market, quite often you don't want to do an IPO, um, so that comes into play also. But things you can control: um, your capital structure, how much debt versus preferred stock versus retained earnings versus common stock do you want to have on the books? How much you pay in dividends? plus the firm's investment policy. What kind of projects will you undertake? Um, you know, basically, you know, we're going to talk about capital budgeting and we'll determine in capital budgeting what kind of projects you should undertake um, in terms of um, factoring in risk and return and trying to add value to the firm. Firms with riskier projects generally have a higher whack. You can definitely take on projects that are fairly safe or projects that are fairly risky or have a mix of both or just go real risky too with everything and that will raise your WAC. Should a company use the composite WAC as a hurdle rate for each project? And the answer is no. And we have to take into account that different projects have different risks. Um, just like as you might do a stock analysis and decide what company to purchase stock of, Again, you have to look at it from the lens of, well, some companies are just riskier than others, and so I'm, you know, th that comes into play. Same thing here. So as a corporation, uh, we can choose to um, invest our funds into various types of projects, and some will be risky and some won't be, and some will be kind of just in between. So the composite WAC reflects the risk of an average project undertaken by the firm. Uh, therefore, the WAC only represents the hurdle rate for a typical project with average risk. And the hurdle rate just basically means that's the return I need to clear. Just literally think of it as jumping over a hurdle. And let's just say our WAC, uh, in the previous example, the WAC we came up with uh, was 11.1. .1. Okay, So if I'm taking on an average project with average risk, it makes sense that I'd want to achieve a rate of return above 11.1. .1. If, if I do my calculations and I come up with, with an average project, if I get 12% return, um, I would take on that project because I'm beating the hurdle rate. Okay, But if I'm taking on a riskier project, um, I would want something way above 11 to reflect that risk. If I'm taking on a safe project, I'm okay maybe getting a 10% return because I just know it's going to... it's. I'm going to get that. It's a very safe project. It's going to work out. So things to consider. Uh, the next slide illustrates the importance of risk adjusting the cost of capital. It says note if the company correctly risk adjusted the WAC, it would select project L and reject H. Alternatively, if they didn't risk adjust, then they would do the opposite and, and make the wrong choice. Okay. So the composite is 10. In this example, the composite is 10. Okay but we're taking in risk. Okay, so we're taking in high versus low risk. And then basically as long as we're risk adjusting the rate of return on a project, that will help us make the correct um, decision about what project to select. So um, understanding those formulas, understanding the components of each formula, kind of why they're there is really important for this chapter. Um, this chapter kind of sets up the capital budgeting chapter, which is where we learn um, more about this slide. Um, what projects do we actually undertake? So we'll, that that will be that will be up and coming. If you have any questions, just let me know. We'll do one more um, lecture on Chapter 10 with, with a couple of examples.